Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramhansa Yogananda. Chapter 9 The Blissful Devotee and His Cosmic Romance. Little sir, please be seated. I am talking to my Divine Mother. Silently I had entered the room in great awe. The angelic appearance of Master Mahashai fairly dazzled me. With silky white beard and large lustrous eyes, he seemed an incarnation of purity. His upraised chin and folded hands apprised me that my first visit had disturbed him in the midst of his devotions. His simple words of greeting produced the most violent effect my nature had so far experienced. The bitter separation of my mother's death I had thought the measure of all anguish. Now an agony at separation from my divine mother was an indescribable torture of the spirit. I fell moaning to the floor. Little sir, quiet yourself. The saint was sympathetically distressed. Abandoned in some oceanic desolation, I clutched his feet as the sole raft of my rescue. Holy sir, thy intercession, ask divine mother if I find any favor in her sight. This promise is not one easily bestowed. The master was constrained to silence. Beyond reach of doubt, I was convinced that Master Mahashai was in intimate converse with the Universal Mother. It was deep humiliation to realize that my eyes were blind to her who, even at this moment, was perceptible to the faultless gaze of the saint. Shamelessly gripping his feet, deaf to his gentle remonstrances, I besought him again and again for his intervening grace. I will make your plea to the Beloved. The Master's capitulation came with a slow, compassionate smile. What power in those few words that my being should know release from its stormy exile? Sir, remember your pledge. I shall return soon for her message. Joyful anticipation rang in my voice that only a moment ago had been sobbing in sorrow. Descending the long stairway, I was overwhelmed by memories. This house at 50 Amherst Street, now the residence of Master Mahashai, had once been my family home, scene of my mother's death. Here my human heart had broken for the vanished mother, and here today my spirit had been as though crucified by the absence of the Divine Mother. Hallowed walls, silent witness of my grievous hurts and final healing. My steps were eager as I returned to my Gorpar Road home. Seeking the seclusion of my small attic, I remained in meditation until ten o'clock. The darkness of the warm Indian night was suddenly lit with a wondrous vision. Haloed in splendor, the Divine Mother stood before me, her gaze, tenderly smiling, was beauty itself. Always have I loved thee, ever shall I love thee. The celestial tones still ringing in the air, she disappeared. The sun on the following morning had hardly risen to an angle of decorum when I paid my second visit to Master Mahashai. Climbing the staircase in the house of poignant memories, I reached his fourth-floor room. The knob of the closed door was wrapped around with a cloth, a hint, I felt, that the saint desired privacy. As I stood irresolutely on the landing, the door was opened by the master's welcoming hand. I knelt at his holy feet. In a playful mood, I wore a solemn mask over my face, hiding the divine elation. Sir, I have come, very early, I confess, for your message. Did the beloved mother say anything about me? 
mischievous little sir. Not another remark would he make. Apparently my assumed gravity was unimpressive. Why so mysterious, so evasive? Do saints never speak plainly? Perhaps I was a little provoked. Must you test me? His calm eyes were full of understanding. Could I add a single word this morning to the assurance you received last night at ten o'clock from the beautiful mother herself? Master Mahashai possessed control over the floodgates of my soul. Again I plunged, prostrate at his feet, but this time my tears welled from a bliss, not a pain past bearing. Think you that your devotion did not touch the infinite mercy? The motherhood of God that you have worshipped in forms both human and divine could never fail to answer your forsaken cry. Who was this simple saint whose least request to the universal spirit met with sweet acquiescence? His role in the world was humble, as befitted the greatest man of humility I ever knew. In this Amherst Street house, Master Mahashai conducted a small high school for boys. No words of chastisement passed his lips. No rule and ferule maintained his discipline. Higher mathematics indeed were taught in these modest classrooms, and a chemistry of love absent from the textbooks. He spread his wisdom by spiritual contagion rather than impermeable precept. Consumed by an unsophisticated passion for the Divine Mother, the saint no more demanded the outward forms of respect than a child. I am not your guru. He shall come a little later, he told me. Through his guidance, your experiences of the divine, in terms of love and devotion, shall be translated into his terms of fathomless wisdom. Every late afternoon, I betook myself to Amherst Street, I sought Master Mahashai's divine cup, so full that its drops daily overflowed on my being. Never before had I bowed in utter reverence. Now I felt it an immeasurable privilege even to tread the same ground which Master Mahashai sanctified. Sir, please wear this champak garland I have fashioned especially for you. I arrived one evening, holding my chain of flowers, but shyly he drew away, repeatedly refusing the honor. Perceiving my hurt, he finally smiled consent. Since we are both devotees of the mother, you may put the garland on this bodily temple as offering to her who dwells within. His vast nature lacked space in which any egotistical consideration could gain foothold. Let us go tomorrow to the Dakineshar temple, forever hallowed by my guru. Master Mahashai was a disciple of a Christ-like master, Sri Ramakrishna Paramhansa. The four-mile journey on the following morning was taken by boat on the Ganges. We entered the nine-domed temple of Kali, where the figures of the Divine Mother and Shiva rest on a burnished silver lotus, its thousand petals meticulously chiseled. Master Mahashai beamed in enchantment. He was engaged in his inexhaustible romance with the Beloved. As he chanted her name, my enraptured heart seemed shattered into a thousand pieces. We strolled later through the sacred precincts, halting in a tamarisk grove. The manna characteristically exuded by this tree was symbolic of the heavenly food Master Mahashai was bestowing. His divine invocations continued. I sat rigidly motionless on the grass amid the pink feathery tamarisk flowers. Temporarily absent from the body, I soared in a supernal visit. 
This was the first of many pilgrimages to Dokkineshwar with the holy teacher. From him I learned the sweetness of God in the aspect of mother or divine mercy. The childlike saint found little appeal in the father aspect or divine justice. Stern, exacting mathematical judgment was alien to his gentle nature. He can serve as an earthly prototype for the very angels of heaven, I thought fondly, watching him one day at his prayers. Without a breath of censure or criticism, he surveyed the world with eyes long familiar with the primal purity. His body, mind, speech, and actions were effortlessly harmonized with his soul's simplicity. My master told me so. Shrinking from personal assertion, the saint ended any sage counsel with this invariable tribute. So deep was his identity with Sri Ramakrishna that Master Mahashai no longer considered his thoughts as his own. Hand in hand, the saint and I walked one evening on the block of his school, my joy was dimmed by the arrival of a conceited acquaintance who burdened us with a lengthy discourse. I see this man doesn't please you, the saint's whisper to me was unheard by the egotist, spellbound by his own monologue. I have spoken to Divine Mother about it. She realizes our sad predicament. As soon as we get to yonder red house, she has promised to remind him of more urgent business. My eyes were glued to the sight of salvation. Reaching its red gate, the man unaccountably turned and departed, neither finishing his sentence nor saying goodbye. The assaulted heir was comforted with peace. Another day found me walking alone near the Howrah railway station. I stood for a moment by a temple, silently criticizing a small group of men with drum and cymbals who were violently reciting a chant. How undevotionally they use the Lord's divine name in mechanical repetition, I reflected. My gaze was astonished by the rapid approach of Master Mahashai. Sir, how come you here? The saint, ignoring my question, answered my thought. Isn't it true, little sir, that the beloved's name sounds sweet from all lips, ignorant or wise? He passed his arm around me affectionately. I found myself carried on his magic carpet to the merciful presence. Would you like to see some bioscopes? This question one afternoon from Master Mahashai was mystifying. The term was then used in India to signify motion pictures. I agreed, glad to be in his company in any circumstances. A brisk walk brought us to the garden fronting Calcutta University. My companion indicated a bench near the Goldighi or pond. Let us sit here for a few minutes. My master always asked me to meditate whenever I saw an expanse of water. Here its placidity reminds us of the vast calmness of God. As all things can be reflected in water, so the whole universe is mirrored in the lake of the cosmic mind, so my Gurudeva often said. Soon we entered a university hall where a lecture was in progress. It proved abysmally dull, though varied occasionally by lantern-slide illustrations, equally uninteresting. So this is the kind of bioscope the master wanted me to see. My thought was impatient, yet I would not hurt the saint by revealing boredom on my face. But he leaned toward me confidentially. I see, little sir, that you don't like this bioscope. I have mentioned it to Divine Mother. She is in full sympathy with us both. She tells me that the electric lights will now go out and won't be relit until we have a chance to leave the room. 
As his whisper ended, the hall was plunged into darkness. The professor's strident voice was stilled in astonishment, then remarked, uh, "'The electrical system of this hall appears to be defective.' By this time, Master Mahashai and I were safely across the threshold. Glancing back from the corridor, I saw that the scene of our martyrdom had again become illuminated. Little sir, you were disappointed in that bioscope, but I think you will like a different one. The saint and I were standing on the sidewalk in front of the university building. He gently slapped my chest over the heart. A transforming silence ensued. Just as the modern talkies become inaudible motion pictures when the sound apparatus goes out of order, so the divine hand, by some strange miracle, stifled the earthly bustle. The pedestrians, as well as the passing trolley cars, automobiles, bullock carts, and iron-wheeled hackney carriages, were all in noiseless transit. As though possessing an omnipresent eye, I beheld the scenes which were behind me and to each side as easily as those in front. The whole spectacle of activity in that small section of Calcutta passed before me without a sound. Like a glow of fire, dimly seen beneath a thin coat of ashes, a mellow luminescence permeated the panoramic view. My own body seemed nothing more than one of the many shadows, though it was motionless while the others flitted mutely to and fro. Several boys, friends of mine, approached and passed on. Though they had looked directly at me, it was without recognition. The unique pantomime brought me an inexpressible ecstasy. I drank deep from some blissful fount. Suddenly my chest received another soft blow from Master Mahashai. The pandemonium of the world burst upon my unwilling ears. I staggered, as though harshly awakened from a gossamer dream. The transcendental wine removed beyond my reach. Little sir, I see you found the second bioscope to your liking. The saint was smiling. I started to drop in gratitude on the ground before him. You can't do that to me now. You know God is in your temple also. I won't let Divine Mother touch my feet through your hands. If anyone observed the unpretentious master and myself, as we walked away from the crowded pavement, the onlooker surely suspected us of intoxication. I felt that the falling shades of evening were sympathetically drunk with God. When darkness recovered from its nightly swoon, I faced the new morning bereft of my ecstatic mood. But ever enshrined in memory, is the seraphic son of Divine Mother, Master Mahashai. Trying with poor words to do justice to his benignity, I wonder if Master Mahashai and others among the deep-visioned saints whose paths crossed mine knew that years later in a western land I would be writing about their lives as divine devotees. Therefore knowledge would not surprise me, nor, I hope, my readers,